I think you're going to be hearing a lot uh, in the next couple of days uh, of, of kind of what I suppose I would call industry talk about distribution and, and communication between writers and readers and so on. But so what I, I mean, as a novelist, I thought what I would do to kick things off and to centre it on the work itself is actually talk about what the possibilities for literature are in in the, what we're calling the digital age. So. Um, this is the title of my talk, which would love to become clear, and uh, I'm going to start by reading a poem. Um, and this poem is called States. A nation is like a republic, a country, a kingdom, a colony, a province, a state. A nation is like the Dutch or the French, like a council or an industry, like a federation, like an empire. Politics is like domestication, repair, amalgamation, hangings and shootouts. Politics is conclaves and inaugurations, nobility dies, skirmishes and coronations. Politics is suppers, aspersions, bunrakus. Pride is like respirators, pills and medications. Contemporary prestige, gerunds, exclamations. Pride is like secession, objection, shelter, the scriptures and logic. Pride is your clothes, your girlfriend, a meal. And this poem is from a book called Discourse.cpp by OS Le C, or Le Cy. And OS Le Cy, or C, is a computer sitting in a research lab in Cambridge. You know, its poetry was produced while it was taking part in a project in that field of ontology extraction, which is a subfield of it's called natural language processing, which put very simply, this subfield, ontology extraction, specializes in producing lists. So you can clearly see this is a list <laughs> poem. And the rationale behind this effort to create lists is that computers should be able to search for very specific information on the internet or other digital archives, you know, regardless of the way in which that information is expressed. You know, I mean, a typical task that um, researchers might set a computer in this field would be to, 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 to search for the names of Oscar nominees or uh, the names of dead presidents. And you know, the point is not just to find the search terms from a sort of pre-given list. You know, if you know Lincoln as president, clearly you can just search for the string Lincoln. Um, but to find the ontologies behind the terms, that's to say the underlying characteristics that identify something as a president from the context in which that word is used. You know, the machine, for instance, could be asked to produce a list of things that are like trucks, and you know, it could return this kind of thing, you know, lorry, car, motorcycle, plane, or engine. It might also return hamster, because uh, hamsters have wheels, and, uh, and trucks also have wheels. And that sort of error points to the real challenge of ontology extraction. You know, how, do you, how do you know that a hamster is significantly less like a truck than a car? Um, I mean, the interesting aspect of this similarity task is that in order to find words that are like lorry, the computer has to use, look at the way that human beings use words and linguistic contexts that are deemed sort of statistically characteristic of the word will be used to produce the lists of things that are similar. Um, and of course, I'll go back to the poem. Um, I mean, this poem was edited by uh, a, a program and researcher called Aurelie Herbelot. And of course she intervened in various ways. I mean, you know, where are the line breaks coming from? You know, there's, there's some clear rhymes. You know, reading it out, you can notice that there's a lot of literary construction in this. And um, this isn't something that the computer has been programmed to do itself. So this is, in some sense, a collaboration between the list-generating machine and, and, and uh, and a human who has a literary sensibility. And you know, the poem was actually constructed by finding the 12 nouns most similar to the noun nation, with no change in order, followed by content selected from the 18 most similar words to politics. And notice that word selected, and that there's clearly been some, some uh, taste, tasteful editing done there. Um, no order change, but some singular words were pluralized, followed by content selected 21 most similar words to pride, to change the order, and some singulars were pluralized. Articles and punctuation were added, as well as word sequence. The word sequence is like. And the, the content was actually generated 
by this uh, OSSI's similarity finding engine, but the, the raw material is Wikipedia, actually. That's the, that's the, the usage of language on which Wikipedia, Wikipedia before, it forms a, a great data set for people doing this kind of, uh, of work because it is written by real people and has, um, although you know, despite the best efforts of Wikipedians to formalize it and structure it, there's lots of, there's lots of colloquial language on Wikipedia and there's lots of a very, very difficult uh, context for a machine to untangle. I mean, you can see where I'm going with this. You know, the, there's nothing to suggest that in 20 or 50 years' time, computers won't be able to understand very sophisticated ontologies, very sophisticated contexts. You know, and this brings us to ask the question about: Is there anything <coughs> intrinsic to literary language which would resist a computer ultimately being able to construct? Metaphors construct complex, complex contexts for the use of, of words. To make, you know, if this is this is what we can do now with a little a little tweaking from a, from an editor. Um, I would suggest that we're we're entering a digital age when computers may, in some sense, produce produce work that we feel as literary, we experience as literary. Now, you know, it's the sort of thing that writers bristle at. You know, but. There is a question, is there something infinite or uncomputable about literary language that will send you know, the machines into a spin that will make it impossible for <laughs> machines to do this? You know? And that's, that's a major philosophical question you know, that gets to the heart of not just what literature is, but maybe what it is to be human and what it is to, to use language as humans. <clears throat> so you know, I want to say that writing in the digital age just doesn't mean changes in distribution or marketing or communication between writers and readers, but it, it means changes in the work and it means changes in our understanding of what the possibilities of literature is. And that's why I've given the title The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed. Um, and this, because that is the title of the first ever book written by a computer, which was actually as long ago as 1984. Uh, and the computer was called Raptor. This is a, a page of the rather beautifully published book. And you can see, again, that it's this list-like thing that computers are currently you know, are, are good at. It could find similarities. This is a much more primitive similarity engine, but awareness is like consciousness, soul is like spirit, and so on and so forth. And um, I mean, the police, this phrase, the policeman's beard is half constructed, feels to me in this kind of Latinic language, like a very technical an oddly technical register, but at the same time I, I experienced that as a literary. So the question is, you know, why, as always, why do we write? Why do we do this? And, um, you know, for those who care seriously about writing, as I sort of assume we all do in this room, um, we do come again and again to the question of what's worth doing now as writers, what is you know, what questions should literature address? And um, you know, if we feel that literature is a meaningful activity in society, you know, we, we have to answer you know, to answer these questions and answer them anew in the digital age, you know, unless we want to do something more useful and meaningful in society, like being culture secretary or learning to hack a phone. Um, I mean, a traditional notion of what a writer is, a literary writer is, 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 is somebody who is in somehow in touch with their inner self, with their most finely tuned feelings, who can access the deep wells of experience and you know, somehow go to places that non-writers can't go. And you know, this sort of rather sentimental idea that writing is primarily something to do with self-expression has a lot of currency in our culture, and our culture is in thrall to all sorts of notions of the sovereign individual, political, economic notions of the individual who's somehow separate from the, the world. But um, one thing digital culture does is to force us to confront the fact that though we may be individuals within our own sense of self and our own perspective, <coughs> no man is an island. I, I always wanted to put John Dunn with one of these really kind of corporate looking uh, <laughs> network diagram. So this, this is where we are now. Um, you know, I mean, if, if anything, you know, I mean, 
Dunn's notion of, of community and, and, and fellow feeling kind of gets mapped onto our technological reality in a very almost in a crushingly literal way. You know, we're living in a technologically enhanced version of our involvement in each other. I mean, any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind and he has to change his relationship status on Facebook. <laughs> and, and, um, but this, you know, this clearly is doing something in a contextual disservice to John Dunn, but so I apologise. Um, but it's a fun way of trying to say that we live in a moment where whose characteristic figure and a figure it, it would be the figure of the network. I mean, the, the network. Um, you know, that's to say that we have, we live lives that are characterised by our participation in networks and by our realisation that in some way we actually consist of networks. You know, the patterns of neurons in our brains, you know, the networks that traverse us and form us in our social world, you know, our effective links with each other. Um, and so I, I took a little, I mean, I'm a fiction writer and, and so I, I would like just to sort of make a case for what fiction specifically can and should be doing in, in this networked world, in this networked culture. And I, you know, I'd say that one thing that literary fiction can do, and we can do better than other kinds of art making, certainly better than filmmakers and game makers and news journalists and most kinds of visual artists, is, is something to do with understanding networks. And um, you could call it uh, Reification, you know, and another sort of technical sounding word, but forget, for example, the specifically Marxist connotation of reification. But I'm interested in the sense um, in which it's possible through narrative to make something concrete and particular out of an abstraction. You know, in linguistics, reification is simply the transformation of a verb into a noun. It's thingification. You know, to embody becomes embodiment. You know to mark becomes a mark. You know, it's a procedure of fixing things down. And I'd like to suggest that you know, naming the evanescent, naming the fleeting, has always, of course, been an important part of literary art. This kind of fixing is what poets do, is what, is what fiction writers do, is what all kinds of writers try and do. But I'd say that never more than now, um, and so many of the most powerful and ubiquitous aspects of our daily life are these network phenomena. You know, they're distributed, they're made up of many parts, some of which are physical, some of which are made out of data, some of which are people. We you know, people are part of networks. Um, you know, this becomes this kind of fixing things down and understanding this becomes an important sort of task. And to give some examples of, of network phenomena and distributed phenomena. No, and an immune system is not a thing. You cannot go, you know, you cannot surgically extract your immune system from from your body and hold it up like a heart or a lung. Um, you know, the idea of a no fly zone is a very, very sophisticated and complex uh, uh, complex notion. If you impose a no fly zone on a on a, an area of land, that's involving a lot of people and machines and data in communication, the internet clearly, but even you know, even even the familiar thing like a protest, that's a highly networked phenomenon. The border, a border is no longer a physical line in the sand, you know, a border with the border controls has become something that has sort of metastasized and spread through society. You could be washing dishes around the corner in a restaurant and be on the wrong side of the border here in the in the UK. In the Olympics, highly networked. Um, the bond market, of course. And so I'm, I want to make a claim that novels, for example, are particularly good at dealing with, with these, by you know, de describing how it is for characters to navigate through this networked world. Um, and you know, this is a form of, of, of knowledge, you know, which I, you know, uh, the postmodern theorist Francois Lyotard called it narrative knowledge, which is, um, you know, we're at a stage where we have an increasingly rich understanding of, of how signs and, and abstract things, data and so on, are kind of enmeshed with physical things. You, know, you may have heard the phrase, the internet of things, which is really where the, which is going to be the next horizon for internet culture, when 
a kind of capacity to uh, to communicate and be part of networks gets embedded into even very very common day to day objects. If the if the, the, the packet on the supermarket shelf knows where it is, and uh, and can kind of tell the shopper where it is. If you can have if you can have um, you know chips embedded in your socks to tell you where your spare sock is, you're, you're missing the sock. But we're going, we're moving into an unimaginably data-rich period of, of history where um, the kind of, the, of the sort of mass of, of, this, of this data it, it, it is many, many orders of magnitude greater than, than it is now. Um, you know, if one job of, of, of fiction is, is nouning the verbs, so to speak, is kind of fixing the flows and trying to pull out understandable things and particular things out of this mass and this sort of abstract, you know, abstract networks, it's also the other way around. It's verbing the nouns. It's it's uh, it's um, it's uh, opening things up that we thought were were fixed. You know, as fiction writers, we can show how peace tips into war, what it's like to navigate the job market. Um, fiction is, as I'm saying, is, is, a, is a, a networked form. And, I mean, of course, there are informal possibilities that are thrown up by this digital networked age for fiction and for other kinds of writing. Writing takes place in new, in new contexts. There's the way, the way we use language in text messages, in emails, in the automated voices that speak to you on your phone or in the whole system of a call centre the language of online advertising, the language of spam. Um, you know, recently very well regarded novel in the, the States, and if it's come out, because Ben Lerner's leaving the Atocha Station, which is um, in most ways a fairly conventional realist novel, but he has one passage in that where he mimics in a really kind of tone perfect way the kind of slightly fractured flow of language in a conversation, uh, an instant messaging conversation. Somebody's actually telling somebody else about a, a, an extremely disturbing and tragic event, but it's, it's broken in that characteristic way that comes with the, the time lag between typing and waiting for the other person's uh, typing to appear on the screen, and you, know, you overlap accidentally. You start, mm. you start saying something, you don't express yourself completely, and a very, very kind of telegraphic mode of communication <laughs> takes place. I mean, all these kinds of new contexts for the use of, of, of language offer us some formal possibilities in a straightforward way. I mean, for years there have been people writing, you know, epistolary email texts and so on. I mean, when I, I'm quite like 419 letters, there's are fraud letters that you get usually sent from, from Africa. I only mean, because a literary form, these are fascinating, and I've been collecting them for a long, a long time. You know, you, and but and they have they have in in their own sonnet-like way the a very very strict set of rules. You know, you have the the introduction, the the, the terrible story about the dead person who left such a large amount of money, the the difficulty of processing the money, and if only we can have your bank account details, and. Um, and, uh, and so, 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 I mean, there are endless, endless possibilities in these very everyday uses of digital language if you're attentive to them and you're and you're interested in in incorporating them. And I think these these are clear and very sort of simple ways of stretching the the forms of literature. I mean, some people go a lot further. I mean, I recently went to visit the novelist Robert Coover, uh, who teaches at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And Coover, as many of you will know, is one of the sort of foremost postmodern story writers and, and novelists and a hugely important writer. But he's also a complete geek. Um, and for some years, he's been teaching what he calls cave writing. Um, and cave is, is an acronym for computer assisted virtual environment. And, and, and that's what one of them looks like in, in roughly in terms of the. Uh, it's, its existence in the lab. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a cube-like space with a number of projectors uh, and motion sensors, and you wear 3D 3D goggles with some actual some weird little kind of <laughs> balls on sticks for, for the for infrared beams to a certain where you're actually uh, looking. So it has it with one up and one across, so it can get a kind of a, a, a 3D position of you in space, and so as you turn your head, 
the images that are projected onto the walls of the cube change. Now, this is a tool, virtual reality tool, that's been around for years now for looking at architectural fly-throughs, or a lot of engineers use them for designing components and so on and so forth. But Kuba thinks this is a great tool for, for writing, and, and he has students uh, code literary work for this for this system. It has all sorts of disadvantages. I mean, chief of which is is um, something that I'm sure will come up again, which is how what happens to how does work persist across digital formats and across time. And if you make something for the system now, and they upgrade the software, which has, is what's happened to Google's students, that the stuff they made three years ago they can't run anymore. How do, you, how do you access that? What happens to archives? What happens to memory in, in, a, in the digital world? This is an important issue. Um, and also, how do you show this work if you don't have a, somebody else who's got a $10,000 cave system and a, a handy lab to show it? You don't quite, quite get it on your Kindle yet. Um, you know, there's, I mean, I, it was very interesting talking to him about this, but I would, I would actually put, point to this as, as, as a sort of technological failure really, because I mean, we, I, I flew through a, a section in a Borges' library of Babel, the famous text that always seems to kind of come up in, in, in discussions of non-linear writing, and, and this comes sort of every presenter at a digital conference has by law to mention that story. Um, and I wasn't really sure what I got. Uh, I mean, the fact that I was flying through giant courier font and turn, and you know, what, was that adding anything to the experience that I had on the page, and I, 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 I would say basically no. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this points to another question that I think we have to answer is, you know, what, when, I mean, it's, it's fun to make work to play with the kit and to, to, to find out what it does and what it doesn't do, but at the end of the day, the only, the only kind of criterion of success and failure is, is, is the, the what it gives you, what the experience that it gives you, and and um, I I don't know about you, but I'm still feeling linear words on paper quite a lot, and that <laughs> seems like quite a a good interface to me. Um, I mean, it, it, next thing I would like to bring forward as a sort of starting point for the the weekend would just be quantity and excess, and here's, a, here's an infographic that I've pirated from The Guardian, um, and all you really need to take away from this is that there's just loads of information, there's loads, there's a, they, they, in, a, in a sort of trendy way they decided to kind of uh, physicalise the amount of information in the, in the world right now as, as iPads, and so <laughs> if you cover the stadium in iPads you'd have a tower that's really high. And, um, <laughs> You know, we have you know, storage is cheap. You know, I've got a thing in my bag which has two terabytes of storage, and, and it fits in my pocket. You know, the there is an unprecedented mass of information. There's an unprecedented mass of language. And there's a kind of there's an excess, a sort of sublime excess that can overpower us and can, and um, and induces a certain sort of feeling of of, of smallness. It's like kind of. Shelley looking at Mont Blanc or something made of iPads, um, <laughs> and this you know with the Internet of Things, this is going to I mean, this this is going to be really high. It's going to, it's going to this amount of information is it's going to it's going to grow exponentially, um, and of course you know I mean, not all of that is text. Clearly, a very small proportion of that data is actually text, and of that text, not everything on the in information in the on the internet is actually clever. Um, some, you know, what do we pay attention to in this in this mass of, of work? Um, not everything, um, you know. And so, and it's perhaps unsurprisingly that we're in a um, we're in a period which feels perhaps very like that kind of modernist moment when they felt belated and uh, that all all one could do was to to play in the in the ruins. You know, there's a there's a very strong point of view among some avant-garde writers, particularly from, in contact with in in New York, that the main role of a writer in the digital age is to act as a filter, to use and reuse words that are already there. Why would you create any more? There's a billion iPads full of this. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, the, so the, this point of view goes that it's time to abandon self-expression. It's time to abandon the whole notion of individual creativity in favour of a type of writing which is essentially sort of bricolage. Or, um, you know, the, the poet and theorist Kane Goldsmith, who you may know as the guy who runs ubu.com, the big archive of, of, of avant-garde material on the internet. He calls this uncreative writing, and he's a real uh, a proselytizer for all kinds of writing practices that are very specifically excluded from our traditional notion of what's creative. I mean, he himself published a book called Day, which is a straight typed transcription of the September the 1st, 2000 issue of the New York Times. And he sees the act of copying this pre-existing writing as a kind of artificial restraint, which for him as a writer brings forward the very specific choices you make as you write, you know, and the, and the kind of unconscious things that happen to you when you copy and you introduce material or you, or you change something. Um, you know, as a reading experience, clearly that's not very interesting. But as a you know, as a as a, a writing experience, the act of the act of copying is quite challenging, and it is particularly challenging to this notion of creativity and individuality and self-expression. Um, a writer called David Shields did quite well recently with a, a book called Reality Hunger, and he he basically uh, uh, is banging the drum with a sort of. Uh, a sort of Walter Benjamin type kind of assemblage of pre-existing fragments and texts, and he feels that unacknowledged plagiarism is the way forward in this in this uh, mass of information. And um, you know, and he sets up a kind of straw man notion of the nineteenth century novel as this sort of authoritative lapidary text talking down to you, which is not functioning anymore. And in, against that, he sets something that simultaneously is sort of this collage of quotes, but also is authorised by the presence of the writer as something closer to memoir than the third person novel. Um, I mean, I think that's quite an incoherent idea for reasons that are probably sort of off the, uh, not, not to the point here. I also, I'm also quite suspicious of this pose of belatedness. You know, I think belatedness is something we're quite attached to and it's been around as I say I mean, certainly you can point to the modernist writers who felt that and you can point to that in romantic writers you know, the cult of the ruin in the 18th century is a feeling of belatedness um, you know we love the we love the melancholy of feeling that we come so late and after everything has already happened and um, you know it allows us to be unfailingly ironic and a bit distant and uh, a little bit so superior and unaffected by the things in, in our world. But right now that seems insane. It seems an insanely blinkered position to take to me. I mean, it, uh, we're living through a period when change is happening at an unprecedented rate. And, you know, we, um, you know, th we know there, is a, there is a lot that is new. Um, and we're clearly technologically able to handle our relatedness better than ever before. We can kind of we, we can search we can search the corpus of all that has been said and done with keywords. That wasn't available a generation or two ago. You know, but this kind of conservative notion of a belief and it still hangs around the idea that you know it's all been done already so we don't have to do anything, especially we we don't have the responsibility to make our world and to engage with our world in this sort of full way. But the digital age does ask us questions about authorship, about originality, about what creativity means. And it is worth pointing out, I mean, all these practices that I've been talking about, appropriation and repetition and bricolage, these are very well established in contemporary art, they have been for at least half a century, maybe, maybe more. And it's very interesting to ask the question why the literary world is very resistant to them, why we're as writers very attached to, to a, a, a kind of theory of creative life that seems to come from an earlier period. And um, you know, part of that is obviously to do with things like copyright, which makes publishing a bricolage novel of plagiarized quotations from other people a bit tricky. Um, you know, it's also, I think, to do with the division of labor in the production of books. I always ask myself why it's come about that the job of designing the look and feel of the book is considered a completely separate job to the, the job of, of, of writing text. You know, um, 
you know, visual aspects of writing can carry meaning. Um, here it is, yeah, the thing looks official with tiny leaves around it, which isn't <laughs> true. If you use if you use comic sans, you can you can look casual and a bit stupid, even with a kind of palm door type uh, surrounding. You know, here's, here's a situation where tone and, and, and meaning is carried in in the, the kind of look of a piece of, of text. Um, I'm going to I'm going to sort of devote the rest of well, how much time have I done? Am I doing fifteen? Fifteen. Oh, we're all good then. Um, I will, yeah, I, I can, I, I'm going to scoop through the rest of it without, uh, I'm just, just going to show you some examples of stuff I'm interested in, some stuff I've, I've done, I think it might all be stuff I've done now, but, um, yes, you know, certain sort of writing practices, I, I have a pretty straightforward novelistic writing practice, I practice novels that are, you know, I write novels that get published in traditional ways and have, have, have a kind of sort of traditional frame around them, but I do other things, um, mostly not for money. But um, the, as I say, I'm, I'm interested in found language, and that's all around. It's not just on the internet. I mean, for a while, I've been collecting examples of language around where I live in in Lower Manhattan, and. Uh, Especially in formal, marginal language, graffiti, fly posters, and so on. There's a there's a whole constant sort of chatter of stuff that, uh, and if you willfully misread certain certain things, that's actually a, that's actually a sign of a, a, a venue called Jazz at the Lincoln Center. But the notion of my environment was telling me that I had no access to jazz. I felt I felt quite confrontational about that, um, and. Um, that's a that's a business that's in the in the ground floor of the building where I I live and and that's a message from a Japanese restaurant nearby and there are there are literary practices I mean clearly I've made none of this language I've I've found it I've kind of I've reached into the river and dragged it out of the flow and and I but I find I take great pleasure in that state of being and and would you know would like to find it. Basically, by putting frames around certain sorts of uses of language, you can um, you can you can make <laughs> something that feels like feels like art. Um, that's charming, isn't it? That's a, I mean, something really. <laughs> I, 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 and, the, and the kind of the sort of like, is that what you're really trying to tell us? <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, another technology that I've got. Uh, interested in is um, machine translation. This is um, this is a kind of quite an old text actually, which I made for the the artist Gavin Turk for inclusion in a catalog a few years ago. And as you can see, it's it, it, it's English of a sort. Uh, and what I did was um, was take. A piece of text. I mean, I wrote an introductory paragraph, and then I, I Google Gavin's name for various other people's um, texts and statements uh, about his work, and I put them through uh, one of the web-based translation. I translated it into Korean, and then into French, and then into German, and it did as many iterations on it as I could. And 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 in much like the OS Lasai. Thing I, I intervened in all sorts of particular ways to draw out little things that amused me. Like I particularly like the fact that the white cube turns into white bucket uh, to say everything you you need to, to know. But um, one thing computers and digital technologies do so well is, and, and, and interestingly, is things to do with iteration and repetition and, and, and for algorithmic processes that you can you can kind of conduct on writing. Uh, if any, but I don't, it doesn't seem to work in the same way it used to. But one iteration, of one version of Word that was around a few years ago, if you put all your text through summarizers and and accepted all the auto correction options that Bill Gates was and the paperclip were giving you, um, you could you could produce some sort of some very very interesting things and 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 and, and, and sentences which seem to have a fractal. Things to them, sentences which dropped out into repetitions and little loops of language, 
when they couldn't find any more substitutions, that the, the piece of software would just make sometimes would just sort of repeat the same phrase. So you'd have something that started off as a ten-word sentence with a fairly conventional kind of meaning, but would 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 open up into this sort of abyss of of language. And I mean, we come across garbage like this all the time now. In that, for example, the cleverer kind of spammer will have a, 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 a program that, you, that will grab some piece of natural language and natural feeling language from, uh, from the flow of the internet, paste that into the, the body of the message in order to evade your spam filter, which is looking for certain sorts of characteristically spammy things. Um, there's a, uh, so I've come across Horse Ebooks <coughs> on Twitter. This is one of my favourite uh, Twitter accounts, which is uh, it's Horse underscore Ebooks, um, and this is a this is a a bot. So it's, it, there's no there's no human apparently behind Horse Ebooks, and it, it does what it says in the tin. It's supposed to be a bot that will bring to your initially to bring you to your attention ebooks about horses. Um, <laughs> But what it what it, it's programmed in such a way is to give you a little fragment of language. Occasionally, it'll give you a link to some sort of money making scheme. But nine out of ten tweets are just <coughs> have been have been found. And this thing now has, I think, fifty thousand ish followers because the bits of language it grabs are great. It has it seems to have this kind of oracular tone to it. I don't, I have no idea. If there's any human intervention, I sort of suspect that, I mean, if there is, there's somebody with, with very, very wry sense of humor and very <laughs> good taste. But you, you get something into your inbox that's clearly been kind of snicked out of the middle of a sentence and somehow speaks to you about your day. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by that as a, kind, as a kind of, that feels like literature. It, I experience it as literature, and it has been produced in a, in a way that's no uh, no more, no more human intervention than, than the other sort of side thing. Um, and one last, last kind of uh, thing to show you um, would be this, which is um, I did a, a a performance piece. It's not a normal thing for a, a, a writer to be asked to do, but there's a performance festival in New York called Performer. And uh, I was approached to, to make a, an, an audio piece, something that could, could, be, could be performed on a, on a, on a stage by a, an ensemble. And I'm interested in text-to-voice software around a lot now and getting much, much better than it used to be. I mean, I think the Mac, Macs now have it as a sort of standard, standard thing. Um, and I, I made a piece called 99. And, um, what I uh, did with that was to, 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 to choose two streams of language, one of which I went to look at sites where people were talking very anxiously about debt and finance, and also contact sites, um, um, places like kind of Craigslist contacts, where people were talking about desire, like what, they, what they wanted to do, who they wanted to do it with. And and, and it, uh, so one stream of language in this, this piece is, is kind of bricolors together from, from this material that's about desire and about, uh, about debt. And then against that, I set a second stream of language, which I culled from uh, corporate communications and political communications, because particularly the kind of American political communication that's around a lot at the moment, which is, which is kind of... Uh, aim very specifically at stopping people joining unions and stopping people organizing in any way and, and, and asking them to accept the terms and conditions of their lives as given by their employers and, and, and kind of persuasive language and public language in a very confident and author authoritative and authoritarian type of, of language. And I'll, um, so I'll, I'll play you a minute or two of this. Sure. Champion, world beating performance and innovation. As the world emerges from recession, we need people with the vision and commitment to transform innovation into world beating products. We occupy a 19 years old. 
rather than just through like pre-recording this. More I gave a series of samples to two performers. That was one of the performers. The second performer with another sort of chain of language. And the third performer with some signal processing equipment. So we were able to kind of respond to each other and play in certain sets. I could make two college tags. I don't qualify for financial aid because my mom, who I see twice a year, makes 35k a year. We she can't even afford to support me. How is she supposed to pay for college? My father has to drive out of town in order to work five hour daily. He still wants the cars of his back injury. I am 19. So yeah, you get the, the picture for that. And it's, um, I pretty much end here, um, five more minutes. Great, I'll say, I'll say, I'll put one more thing in front of you that is actually slightly different to this. So, there are all kinds of ways that we can use technology to expand the scope of, of writing, and, and these are some of my experiments in, in doing that, and there are many other people who are, doing it in a very serious and, and, and challenging way. Um, but also, as, as I, I'd like to sort of say, to put forward one thing about, about networks uh, existence as, as writers, and this is a, this is a term that a guy called Eli Paris has put forward called the filter bubble, which I think is very important for, for us as, as writers, as publishers, as editors, as people who, who live in a shared world of language. You know, the filter bubble is a phenomenon that exists across the internet, and it exists in a way that we naturally behave when, when confronted with this enormous excess of, of information. But it exists in particularly concrete terms since December 2009, when Google instituted something called personalized search. Now, what that means is that the Google algorithm will show you the search results it thinks you want to see based on your previous activity and on its assessment of various other factors like where you are in the world and so on and so forth. You know, if there's a restaurant called the Rose of India and it knows you're in North London, it's probably better to show you that one than the Rose of India that's in Vancouver. <laughs> so far, so good, you know. But what that also means is that you're gonna get different search results from me. We, we search for the same thing on Google. We are no longer in a shared space. And we're in a space that has somehow been pre-given to us by the algorithm and by the, by the search engine. And I think that has some potentially very far-reaching consequences. I mean, Parasur, who's written a book about this that I, I recommend, there's also a TED talk, which is, um, he gave a very good kind of 10-minute TED talk on it. Um, he gives an example of two friends searching for the, the term VP soon after the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, spill in the Gulf of Mexico. One, one of them, who was somebody with a kind of lefty activist background, got a lot of material, news stories about the spill and so on. And the other person, putting in the same search terms, got the corporate marketing communication from the company. Complete divergence in 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 what was actually given to them. And this is. This is, this is the way that the internet is, is developing at the moment. I mean, you, you'll see that very strongly in everything that Facebook is doing, everything that all the internet companies are doing who are trying to kind of marketize personal information, trying to, trying, trying to kind of give us uh, an experience that feels special to us, but also in, in return for which we will give up marketing specifics that have value to, to them. You know, our internet, are diverging. You know, they're not going to look or feel the same at all in the future. And <coughs> no one ever was here as the triumph of personal choice. But uh, you know, it's the danger is that in general, as human beings, we like the things we like, and we don't like the things we don't like, and we like to see the things we like, and we don't like to see the things we don't like. And what happens to to things that we don't know we want? What happens to randomness? What happens, I'm, I'm, the more I use the internet, I mean, I, I got my first email address in 1992, and so I'm not a digital native, but now, now it's about half my life has been on the net and half of it hasn't. And um, 
I can't overestimate the importance of serendipity and randomness and the material that comes to you without your, your choice. Uh, and I try and construct an experience for myself that includes that, that includes it. Uh, it uh, um, and I mean, Mark Zuckerberg <coughs> wrote, this is something he like, uses as a, as a, as a, an epigram for his, uh, his book. Yeah. A squirrel dying in front of your house may be more relevant to your interests than people dying in Africa. That's Zuckerberg. And that may be true, but what are the consequences of that? And what are the consequences of, of, a, of a certain sort of myopic notion of the self? So as writers who use this material and will use this material increasingly as, basis, as the basis for our works, and, and, and as people who, who's, who's professional lives have migrated perhaps more fully than any other kind of creative artist onto the net and into these networks. This is a really central question. It points to the end of a, a shared reality, of a kind of commensurability of experience. And, you know, as Martin McLuhan said, you know, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. And that's, that's the point here. That's what I'd like to, to leave you with. Thank you very much for the presentation.